And now, with Sound Investing, here's Paul Merriman. Well, I'm happy to be back, and I'm happy to be back with uh, two of the smartest people I know, well, at least about investing. And, uh, and we are thrilled to be here and answer, I think, one of the most important questions that we face from all of you, and that is, what portfolio do you recommend? And of course, that's an open question that there are so many uh, reasons why we might recommend one over another. We're going to get to that. But I've got, of course, Chris Pedersen and Daryl Balls. Uh, Chris, our director of research, and, and Daryl, our director of analytics. And um, Chris, I think actually uh, this was your baby, your idea to, to do this today. But before we get into this, would you just take a few minutes and talk about the update on the best-in-class portfolios? What's going on there? Sure. Yeah. So uh, normally we update the best in class ETF analysis and I do it very thoroughly every about two years. And, and the reason for going every two years is to avoid whipsawing people and having them trade too often. Uh, and it's important to remember that the fundamental decisions you make in the portfolio are first and foremost equities versus fixed income. And then secondly, which asset classes within equities. And then third, so quite a bit down on the list is which funds to implement those with. So, you know, it, the, the, uh, the difference in results you're going to get with one set of funds versus a different set of funds uh, is generally going to be smaller than the differences in those other choices, provided you're choosing low cost index funds uh, or low cost passively managed funds. So uh, I, I think every two years is a great cadence. The reason we did an interim update, though, is that there were a lot of changes from uh, both Avantis and DFA. There were some important new funds coming available, and I wanted to give those a look and see if they were uh, dramatically better or different from the funds that we currently recommend. And because I, I didn't turn the crank on, you know, a thousand funds in a very thorough way, the way I do when I do the normal annual update, I'm not changing our recommendations, but I am making people aware with this interim update that there are some interesting things coming. And specifically, there are two. So DFA has released an international value fund. The ticker is DFIV. It's also available as a mutual fund and has been for years, DFIVX. And it looks to me, based on a, a quick analysis, like it, it will probably be a better recommendation than EFV, which is our current best in class ETF recommendation when we do the next update. It has a lower expense ratio, it has lower annual turnover, deeper value orientation, and smaller company size. So I think if somebody wanted to uh, switch now, th there'd be nothing wrong with that. Um, and I just, I wanted people to be aware that that was coming. And um, the other great thing about DFA is the way they created these ETFs is rather than creating something new that has no history, which, is the case, for example, with Avantis funds, they come out and they're new and there's very little track record to judge them by. Uh, DFA took a mutual fund that had a long history and uh, created a new share class, which is an ETF. So you can look at that long history and get an idea of how the fund is managed and how it's likely to be managed moving forward. So I think I think DFIV as an international value option is should be on people's radar and that's why we did that. Uh, the other one that I mentioned in the interim update is Avantis Emerging Markets Value, AVES. Uh, we haven't really had a solid emerging markets value fund to recommend. So somebody doing an all value portfolio, for example, might want to include an allocation to emerging markets. And we haven't really been able to, to do that. Um, so I think that one may make the best in class list in that category. 
the reason I'm a little more hesitant about that recommendation right now is that it's the the assets under management are still small. It's likely to trade with a higher bid ask spread, so you'd want to use limit orders when you're buying it, and it doesn't have very much history. So uh, it's hard to say exactly what its track re record has been and how it's going to perform in the future. But by the time we do the next best in class update, hopefully we have more of that information and and we can consider it. So I don't think there's anything wrong with our current best in class recommendations, but I wanted people to be aware of those two as uh, new and interesting things coming along. And, and by the time we do the new best in class update, there will be even more and that'll be fun. Now, I'm, I'm sitting in the seat of an investor who is just getting started with our work. And they just heard you say that it's okay if you use those, but they aren't the official. I also heard that if you don't have any positions in those asset classes right now, that I think you would probably say it's okay uh, to take advantage of what you have a strong feeling will be among members of the best in class uh, in the next year. I, is that a fair statement that that's the group that in particular uh, should should take this as a, a buy recommendation? I, you know, if somebody was new coming in uh, and just implementing, I would I would probably use DFIV over EFV because of the the rationale I described. Mm -hmm. I think I think it would be a good choice. Uh, if somebody already has something going, I have across my lifetime, I have tried to cultivate a, a, uh, a somewhat unnatural behavioral bias towards investing. I like to look at my portfolio as a bar of soap. The more I touch it, the smaller it gets. Yeah. Right. And so when when people see a new piece of information and they're inclined to trade on it, I would hope that they would all take a deep breath, pause, write down why they think want, they want to trade on it, consider the possibility of not doing anything and waiting a little bit longer. Because in my own experience over the, the history of all the changes I've made, I, you know, it's probably a coin flip to what less than a coin flip in terms of the number of times they helped me. A lot of times just leaving stuff alone is the best thing you can do. So. Um, that is another reason why I don't update these super frequently is that I, I, I want most people to be buy and hold investors where they can put it on autopilot, let it ride in the background, uh, not do too much trading. Yeah. So it does bring up one more question that, that uh, I see many of the emails that go to you and you answer them. Uh, uh, you really have been so generous with your time. Uh, and so many of those are, you know, I saw this other one and could you, could you explain why this other one that I really have a good feeling about, it may be because it's performed well lately, I, uh, recently, and, and you, uh, we don't know. Uh, and then you s sit down and you very graciously go through the reason that you pick one over the other. What if you decided you were short of time in your life and you couldn't do that anymore? Let's just assume that. What would you say to these people? What, how, would you, how would you position yourself so that your time is spent doing the best for everybody? And I'm not, by the way, I'm not complaining. Uh, I'm not being critical. It's just a natural thing. People want more detail if somebody will just give it to them. Uh, but what would you say to them that would um, uh, most likely reduce some of that traffic? Uh, well, I'd go back to that core principle that uh, switching and changes and flux and all of that are costly. So be hesitant about making changes. And uh, when you see something new that you get excited about or that's hyped, do your homework on it. So, you know, go to Morningstar, look at how deep the value is compared to what you currently have. Look at how small it is compared to what you currently have. Uh, look at the bid ask spread, look at the assets under management, look at how many holdings uh, there are, how many companies it's invested in. Uh, look at uh, the track record. Has it been stable or has it moved around? You can actually look at that on Morningstar too in the style boxes. They'll tell you the history and say that, you know, 
90% of the time it's been in the right place, but occasionally it drifts, right? Uh, so I would, I, I would just slow down, that philosophically, slow down, do some analysis, uh, write your thoughts about why you think this new thing is better than the old thing. I, especially if there are tax implications, I think this is a great way to slow down too. If it's in a taxable account, think about how much you're going to reduce the size of your investment when you pay those taxes. And then think about how much added return you're going to get from the new investment. And then figure out how many years it's going to take to benefit from the switch. So when, um, I, when I was first starting working with foundation, I, I had a portfolio that was quite, quite complicated. And actually, I still have it. It was inherited. It's, um, you know, in a, in a fund, in a, in a place that it kind of came as a bucket. And I looked at what I thought the added return would be for switching everything. And it had about a seven year payback. It would take seven years if things performed the way I expected them to. We just left it alone. Now I'm getting close to seven years and I'm looking at it going, yeah, it's actually performed the way it was supposed to. <laughs> you know, maybe I should have switched. Um, you know, you can't you can't get them all right, right? Sometimes you're going to get them right. Sometimes you're going to get them wrong. But the fact that I did that analysis slowed me down. And it got me to a realistic expectation that, you know what, it's going to do fine and it has done fine. Um, but if I had switched, we would have paid taxes and it would have made things small enough that I wouldn't have even been a break even for seven years. So you have to kind of, you have to figure out what's best for you. One of the things I always close with is that phrase, you know, we can't advise you. You have to decide, you have to figure out what's best for you. This is a puzzle you're working, we're helping, but you're working the puzzle. And um, so I wish, I wish everyone the best of luck with it. Oh, by the way, speaking of puzzles, are either one of you doing Wordle? No. No? <laughs> I, I no? keep thinking I need to get Wordle? on board, but I haven't oh started yet. We do, we do well, uh, Boggle, I think, which is oh, I, yeah, probably well, the old man, old-fashioned version of Wordle. <laughs> you, I'm sure you will one day. Uh, so I, I appreciate those comments. I do think there's something you just said in that, in, in, in that uh, discussion that if people will just go and do their homework at Morningstar, and when you said that, I said, yep, and we probably need to teach them how to do that homework, and that would eliminate maybe many of those questions. Uh, and that's on our to-do list, our wish list, uh, but other things first. So to the topic of today, uh, this was Chris's idea that we that we discuss the three of us how we feel uh, how we how we look at these different portfolios and which portfolios would we likely recommend to these different kinds of investors and uh, we're talking uh, about a first time investor a, a pre retiree. Maybe somebody, I guess, who's within five years of retirement, and then somebody who is in retirement. And uh, and and I, uh, as I thought about it, it's pretty obvious that that it, you'd want different kinds of portfolios for different kinds of investors. Of course, all of us understand that there are people who are ninety years old and still have all their money in stocks. So. You know, we, we, there, that are individual decisions that our view of it isn't <laughs> isn't going to change how how they feel. But I think that something will come out of this discussion. And and Chris, since since you brought this up, why don't you tackle your feelings about what would the first time investor uh, what what recommend what portfolio would you recommend? So for me, the, the philosophy, and I'm going to probably come back to this same philosophy for the first time investor, the approaching retiree, as well as somebody in retirement. Philosophically, I, I like to see people um, have a broadly diversified portfolio in meaningful ways. And 
the the asset class that I know brings with it under the hood the exposure to the widest amount of diversification is small cap value because you get exposure to the market, you get exposure to small, you get exposure to value. If you pick your fund right, you get a little, little exposure to quality. Um, and historically over time, uh, it if you're unlucky, unlucky and you buy it at the wrong time, your underperformance of the market at large isn't that great, uh, but you have a great chance at outperforming the market. So I like to start with the idea that people would hold as much small cap value as they can stomach and then balance it with a target date fund. And I like the target date fund because it's automatic. It it lowers your risk approaching retirement and into retirement. Uh, so in an ideal world, if I could teach somebody right. if i could sit down and show them the telltale charts and explain what the experience is like and i could and i could teach them those i would love to have them 100 percent in small cap value as a young person and then tell them your life mission and you can do it on your own pace you can do it you know fast or slow however you want once every five years once every 10 years it, you should be trying to ramp that down and transitioning into a target date fund as you approach retirement and probably keep some in small cap value. So we'll come back to that, the rest of that discussion later on the second investor. But uh, yeah, my ideal for a young investor would be 100% in small cap value. And um, they can have that in a taxable or a tax deferred account. And then, uh, you know, ideally the, the part they're picking up in the target date fund should be in a tax deferred account because of the bonds and the fixed income. But yeah, that would be, that'd be where I would start. So that's pushing the pedal of risk down pretty hard. That's great. It does. That's appropriate uh, for people who understand it. And Daryl, yeah. what about you? What what would you do? Because well, you've actually counseled a lot of young people, I think. Well, a, a few. But um, in, in theory, I agree with what Chris said. Um, I think I'm a little more pragmatic, though, in that the thing that worries me about doing that is um is are the, are the people who invest and they 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 wake up one morning and said what do you mean my balance is less today than it was yesterday where did my money go and they worry about it if you know it, it's fine to to say well you shouldn't do that you should not look at it don't look at it every day don't look at it every week every month every quarter maybe every year don't even look at it just put it in and forget it but a lot of people don't do that and or can't do that. And you, you have to think about what is what is the impact or the implication of not being able to do that. And so uh, I might do that, but I I have I have been burned enough times and and I and I I've learned how things work in the past anyway, and how I can react how I react to them now. And so that would not bother me. Um, I don't know if it would have bothered me when I was younger, but I know it bothers some people today. And so I might counsel maybe not quite 100% small cap value to begin with. <laughs> I'm not sure where that would fall. Uh, maybe a 50-50 to begin with. Um, it would be interesting to, to go through and do an analysis. And maybe I'll do that since that's what I do. To say if you start out 50-50 and for the first five or, or seven years, uh, uh, you, you sort of get through that process and you think, well, you know, okay, so this isn't so bad. You know, I, I When you say 50-50, Daryl, what do you mean? You mean 50% like small a, cap value and 50%? I think a target date is fine. Oh, okay. Just, yeah. just clarifying. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. I'm known for being unclear sometimes. Um, so, so, and as you, as you become more um, impervious to some of the fluctuations in the market, as you reach your mid to maybe late 20s, early 30s, maybe you can ramp that up and hop on the curve and then slide down one of the, one of the two fun for life curves as you become more, uh, more knowledgeable about how the market behaves and how you react to it. Um, this is the, the 
you know, don't do anything, don't don't do something, just stand there kind of thing. If you can get through that phase and and learn that, yeah, you, your account balance goes down sometimes. Um, being able to jump back up a level or two and risk, um, at least during the the late early through mid and maybe into the mid late part of your investment career before uh, you have to start drawing money out. Um, I think that might be a useful thing that you're adjusting your asset allocation when you do that. And, and the reason you adjust your asset allocation for me anyway, is to, is because your, your risk tolerance has changed. And normally when people say that they think about ratcheting down risk, but this, when you do it early in your career or in your investment career and you adjust your risk, your asset allocation due to risk, it's because you become more understanding about what risk is and you realize you can take more risk so you can crank that up. This is probably something that you would, well, probably would do in a, in a tax deferred account. That's or great. A tax advantage account somehow, but so. Good advice, Daryl. I like it. Things. Another another analysis to do. Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> but so so does that actually lead you to any of the particular portfolios? I mean, is there? Uh, are you just suggesting the the two funds for life with the small cap value and the uh, and and the uh, the target date fund, or is it is it something else in that? group of, I think we have about nine different portfolios now. Well, I, yeah, excuse me. I think a two funds for life with a small cap value is is fine. Um, it depends on how, how engaged the individual is, I think. If they wanted to do something uh, a little different, maybe the, the uh, rather than having the, it, it gets more complicated if you, if you try to do that, do it without the, the target date fund. Because then you have choices to make about about uh, which asset classes you put in there, how much international, how much bonds, what do you do with bonds? You know, do you do anything with bonds? You have all these other decisions to make, and that's the thing that I like about the two funds for life. Those are all made for you. So what you're really doing is is working around the edge of that, trying to add value. Yeah. No pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> to the to the. To the portfolio by by trying to figure out a way to uh, increase your expected return. That's great. That's helpful. And uh, uh, you uh, created tables that made me think more about this decision. And I have said time and time again, and some people think I'm kidding, that I've never had an original idea. I have had the good fortune of having been exposed to some what I consider to be great ideas. And obviously the two fund strategy that Chris developed uh, has been uh, a, a, big, a big hit. I, I, I like it so much. I also like what you ended up creating, Daryl, with the, uh, these views of all these different portfolios in the no nonsense and the 150 portfolios better than yours tables that you did. Mm -hmm. And as I look at those, uh, I, I start to think that if we can get somebody really believing the data, as we look back at those numbers from 1970 through 2021, and I look at the different portfolios and we start with the benchmark being the S&P 500. And we happen to know that it got an 11% compound rate of return, just a little bit more than that before expenses. And which, which by the way, is the 40 year average return since 1928. And did you have a comment, Daryl? I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, this is kind of an aside. It's a break in the middle here. I have those tables up. If oh. you wanted to pop them up. Yeah, that'd be great. You, you want to do that, Chris? Sure. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Um, where are they here? I I would love to go to the uh look at the, for example, the all value portfolio. Ah, there it is, right there. Can all you get all it? US value values right here. 
uh, and here all are the, the other here are the other non okay. can you get that bigger this. or is that something i have to do at my end uh zoom it was bigger a second ago i Whoa. think it's I, that's I, probably too big um, here we go perfect perfect uh well let me let me say uh, about that there we go. Let's just stay right there for a sec because I see the all value on the far right hand side, US only. And what I noticed about that is the compound rate of return is over 14% versus over 11 for the S&P 500. And the other part I notice is that there were 10 losing years that were almost exactly the same on average as the 10 losing years of the S&P 500. And then when I look at the Sortino ratio, uh, which is a measure of volatility on the downside, correct, Daryl? Yes. It's a way well, to- it's, it's, it's like the Sharpe ratio. So it's a measure of risk adjusted uh, What's, I was, I wasn't it's it's a measure of return right. per unit of downside risk. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. what it says is it gets a really good Sortino score. Uh, it, 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 it's standard deviation is going to be higher. I mean, not wildly higher, but it, but also standard deviation uh, reflects both upside and downside volatility. And this, this fund did better on the upside. So I'm thinking for somebody who is uh, uh, feels like they have more risk tolerance, a young person, or maybe they've got some money that they want to be more aggressive with, I would be a fan, whether it's the, the all-value U.S. or the all-value worldwide. The returns are virtually the same. The risk is very similar. And so that would be my recommendation if somebody wanted to be all equities for those early years, I would guess the, the first 20 years. I don't know what your thoughts might be in, in, in that term, but anyhow, that is the, stra the strategy I'm voting for today. Would I be happy as I look at the other ones like the four fund US, 13.2%. 1% less per year over this same 52-year uh, period. Uh, but the other scores, everything uh, is very favorable. Uh, I guess the main message would be I'd sure be looking somewhere else than just the S&P 500. So uh, that, would be, that would be my vote, uh, but most of them. And, and we were talking about this before we got started. And I actually wanted to ask Daryl more questions about it. But uh, Daryl, you made a comment that when you look over the long term, uh, the, these strategies look a lot alike. Would you even say that about the all value versus, for example, uh, uh, a target date portfolio that's a combination of several? Um, <clears throat> I'd have, well, I don't think the target date portfolios would look a lot like the all value portfolios in terms yeah. of their statistics. When you're talking about, for example, the average, if you look at average up year gain, um, you know, the best year, the down, down average down year, uh, year loss and the worst year loss, uh, these are calendar years. So not yeah. 12, not 12 months, but a lot of these look, they look similar, you know, they're, 22, 21, 22, or down, you know, 16, 16, 12% for the four fund US. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the, the all US, it's 23%, you know, and it's down 14%. So they're, they're very similar when you look at those statistics. The things that, that make a difference, I think, are, are the, the sequences of how those returns occur when mm. combined with either a target date fund or a total market fund or the S P five hundred. Um, well, a plus, a plus. A I, plus. I I think importantly, the S and P five hundred as a standalone fund, which is going to look a lot like the target date fund in terms of 
uh, of uh, returns in the early uh, years, um, uh, it has, because it is in essence, kind of a single asset class, large cap growth mostly, uh, it's gonna have a period where that one asset class doesn't do as well as owning the, the, the group of asset classes. So uh, that's another, I think, advantage of having these, like, like Chris said, adding, and you did too, Daryl, adding the small cap value uh, to what is basically a large cap growth portfolio. Well, if, if, you, if you looked at, at the total world plus 30% U.S. small cap value, that's, that's in essence the equity part of a two funds for life with a 30% small cap add-on, right? Yeah. It, it, the bonds are a little, fixed income is a little different issue. But you can see how when you do that, the, the worst years go down, the average up year gain goes down a little bit. Uh, compared to the all U.S. value, but but they're not dramatic, um, dramatically. Now, two percent is a big deal, but um, but the down downside uh, average down year loss is less. Um, but the worst year is about the same. So you yeah. know these tables I think can help people figure out how to how to look at and and look at the data and sort of sort through it a little bit. And maybe get some peace of mind, which I think um, Chris made that, that that point. You've got to get comfortable with this. And our hope is these tables, these numbers, uh, take the emotion out of it. Of course, it assumes that uh, you have the patience to, to deal with the numbers. But uh, uh, we're going to keep we're going to keep cranking them out. Now let's go to the, the actually, Paul. Yeah. Just before we move on, I wanted to. Uh, just piggyback off, I think it was three things you guys said. Um, number one, I, I like the idea of staying all equities for the first 20 years. If somebody starts at 25 or 20, um, that's about where the target date funds crest or start to go down. Number two, I, I love the idea of diversifying internationally within the asset class of small cap value. So I think Daryl and I both agree with that. Mm -hmm. And then number three, although I don't have a table to throw up because it's from my book. Uh, just to Daryl's comment about you know putting somebody in small cap value and the odds of them being disappointed, um, part of that's going to be masked by the fact that they're making regular contributions. So it'd be hard for them to figure out, well, did I outperform or underperform? Because you'd have to do a an IRR calculation based on the cash flows, you know. Um, I disagree. It's real easy for them to figure out whether they underperformed or overperformed. They just look at the balance. But you'd have to compare the balance to somebody no. who had invested in the S and P five hundred. No, no. That's my point. I think I think they're very. It's a very simplistic thing. It's it, all they do is look at the bank balance or the account balance. If it goes down, it's bad. If it goes up, that's good. That's, I, that's I understand true. what you're saying, and I but agree we, from an analytical pr perspective. That's but true. But we know in the but, early years, due to the cash flow, that the drawdowns are reduced. Yes. Because that's so, so yeah, it's going to sometimes go up and down, but it's going to go down less than it will later in their investing experience. So, so I I view a young investor as having training wheels on, but just yeah. at a very substantive level, you know, what are the odds of them underperforming the S and P five hundred if they're all in small cap value? At ten years, they've got about a two thirds chance of outperforming. At 20 years, it goes up to about uh, 90%. And by the time you're out to 30 years, you're getting close to 95, 99. So there is a, a real probability that maybe they would underperform and learn the wrong lesson and go to total target date fund. I'd actually be okay with that. They'd still do fine across a lifetime, but I like, I like the fact that the odds are tilted in their favor, yeah. So we we probably should move on, Paul. But anyway, I just wanted to. I'm no, no, that's great. That's that's wonderful. I mean, we we are sitting at a round table here, and we're all yeah, this, this <laughs> is, is what you're saying. Here. Chris. I like it. This is what you're saying, right? This is the Small uh, This is the the probability essentially observed historical outperformance. Of U.S. small cap value versus the S and P yep. 500 yep, versus exactly. the top horizon. Yeah. By the time you get out to 20, there there is no 20 year period in this 
however many years this was, where you would have done worse by being in small cap value. And, and no. in fact, no. if if you look at even over the time time periods of one year or so, you still do better than the S&P 500 56% of the time. In the past, you've done, done that. So you know, it's, it's interesting way too short a time that. to learn anything from. But if you look at, at 10, 10 years, which is not that long a time, three quarters of the time you've done better. Yeah, my numbers were a little bit lower. And that's, I think, because I burdened them with a little bit higher expense ratio. But the story is essentially the same. Yeah. I, I will comment that I get a lot of emails about how, how small cap value has underperformed the market for decades. And uh, I, one uh, individual was so emphatic about this. I said, well, from 1975 to 1999, the S&P 500 compounded at over 17%. And from 2000 until today, it has compounded at about 7.5%. It too has underperformed for decades. And, and, um, and I, I do think that one of the challenges is people are looking at different indexes. And there are indexes. It's it's just like uh, that, Chris. That that ETF that you picked for small cap value, it outperformed some of those small cap value indexes by well over twenty. I'm sorry, over ten percent. And that was because it was in a way a different. It's not an index that everybody knows. It's a way they built it to be basically a passive portfolio. What do you got? You got a share there, Daryl. Well, this is just a telltale chart that, that you were talking about. For example, ah, from, yeah. okay. from 2000 to out here, yep. you would you would be ahead if you were in the S or, or in a uh, uh, small, small cap. cap value. Yeah. yeah. There's almost no, no time period um, if you go back here a ways, where if you would have hopped on this curve, you would be worse than you, than you are now, or then where you'd be worse than you were in the S&P 500. So uh, I think you're right. This is in the past again. This is historical data, um, but, yep. you know. Okay, let's move on to the pre-retiree. Chris, what different advice would you give them? You're going to keep making me go first, huh? Of um, course. <laughs> I, well, I would tell the pre-retiree philosophically the same thing that, you know, I'd like you to have as much small cap value as you can stomach and balance it with a target date fund. Now, I think most retirees would be uncomfortable with a 50 or 60% uncertainty in the size of their nest egg. And, and that's what you're going to get if you're at a high... 50 or 50% 50 or higher allocation to small cap value. So I think uh, somebody approaching retirement, uh, having 20% in small cap value, you, you, I, I view this as you're going to make me pick an answer, right? So I'm going to say 20% in small cap value and the rest in a target date fund. The target date fund is going to be very conservative. It's going to be ramping the equities down. It's going to uh, have a, a low uncertainty in its balance. But the, uh, the small cap value is going to give you meaningful diversification. And it's also, as you enter retirement and continue into retirement, going to give you uh, a better safe withdrawal rate. Which, which is more resilience uh, in the face of potential sequence risk, return sequence risk. So uh, I like having some in there. And if you can't stomach 20, 10, that's fine. 10% would be fine. And in terms of rebalancing, uh, I like, I, I'd be fine if they weren't rebalancing. They were just, you know, holding that as a fixed allocation and, and kind of letting it ride. But then, um, using nudge rebalancing as you as you get into retirement where you just you, you take out of whichever one's too big your annual withdrawals so that's that's my answer for for the the pre-retiree yeah now you just opened pandora's box on that one because we i'm sure people are thinking nudge 
distribution. Just give us a little more on that. Yeah. So, so uh, if you're using a 20% allocation to small cap value, 80% allocation to the target date fund, and you're at retirement and you're ready to take your first withdrawal, you look into the account and whichever asset class is bigger than it's supposed to be, you take your full withdrawal from that. So if the, the allocation you have at that point in time to small cap value is 21% and your fixed withdrawals are 4%, you take 4% from the 21, which takes you down to 17. Um, and, and yeah, that means that you kind of overshot in terms of the correction. And if you want to get mathematical and you want to do it exactly precisely so that you get exactly what you want, that's fine. You can do that too. But um, in my back testing, you can simplify and you can do that really simple thing of just taking, taking it all from the one that's too big and you still get a, a very similar result over your retirement lifetime, if, if you will. So I like that because it means you don't have much math to do. You don't have to look at your funds a lot. You don't have a lot of thinking or second guessing to do. Uh, it's relatively simple. And, um, right. you know, odds are the next year you'll take the full withdrawal from the, the target date fund. So it, yeah. and it kind of goes back and forth and you just ping pong. Yeah, that's, that's great. All right, Daryl, what you got for the middle age? Uh, that's well, what we call the, middle age, 60 now, I think, right? For the person that's, yeah, for the person that's approaching retirement, um, I I think that's that strategy, that, the strategy that Chris um, discussed is is perfectly fine. My, uh, in fact, it's one that, that I would probably recommend. The only, the only caveat I might have is depending on how, uh, how, concerned you happen to be about immediate retirement, immediate pre-retirement sequence of returns risk um, impacting your, your portfolio at retirement is um, you could consider doing something along the lines of what uh, Michael Kitsis proposed here several years ago, and that's what he called a bond tent. What he really means is you increase your allocation prior to your, your retirement um, to bonds. Your bond allocation, little, yeah. Yeah, your bond, yeah, your bond allocation a little bit at a time, starting some some years before retirement. And then, and, and so it, it, if, you, if you look at it from a, 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 a bond allocation, it kind of goes up and then it kind of comes down after after retirement a little bit. And, and what that does is it gets you through that, that High, get you through the danger zone of right around retirement where where a, a big hit in the market can impact your portfolio's ability to sustain your spending post retirement. Um, I, this is just to amplify that one of the things I like about the nudge withdrawals on small cap value in retirement is that it actually leads to that behavior because yes the nudges aren't enough to tamp down the small cap value throughout your retirement. And so what tends to happen is it grows faster than the target date fund and effectively lowers the percent you have in bonds on the tail right. end. So it actually facilitates this bond tent behavior without you having to think about it. Yeah. And that a lot of people refer to the, the <laughs> This was probably a mistake, I think, on Kitsis's part, and Kitsis and Wade Fowl, I think, was part of this also at the same time. But, but the they ended up calling it a rising glide path, and what they really meant was that the as you pass through retirement, your your equity allocation goes down because your bond allocation goes up, and what that means is that after you retire, your equity allocation goes up, so it rises, but it's only going back to where it was before. So really, in essence, and so, uh, and that's exactly what Chris is talking about here. Um, taking nudge withdrawals, in effect, can can result in a rising glide path, if you will. Uh, well, through, just just fine, actually, and and and, and you know, uh, as long as you have sufficient assets to cover your expenses, that's fine. So let me just ask you for one number then, at retirement. What percentage would you recommend 
uh, an average investor have in fixed income? Um, I can't do that. Okay. Because I think it depends on the size of your portfolio. It depends on your risk. It depends on the risk. And that depends on the size of your portfolio relative to your withdrawals. If you have a, a, a safe withdrawal rate of 2%, you can have a lot higher equity allocation. If you have a, a withdrawal rate, uh, an expense withdrawal rate of 5 or 6%, and you, if you think about it in terms of a, of a safe withdrawal rate, not everybody does this. Not most nobody does that in reality. But if you think about it that way, um, that's a little bit riskier situation. So, if I'm if I'm in a situation where I have a higher um, with, withdrawal rate, instantaneous withdrawal rate or annual withdrawal rate, I would tend to move towards maybe more towards forty or fifty percent equities. Um, if I can, if I have a lower withdrawal rate, you can move to a higher uh, equity expense ratio, uh, equity ratio. Um, yeah, the hardest seven, part of this exercise is that it's one size fits all. Um, yeah, I but, mean that's. But it is kind of a fun thought process. Uh, yeah. The the specific answer to your question for my recommendation would be if you're using a Vanguard target date fund, it's 50% in equities and 50% in bonds at retirement. So if you've got 80% in that, then that's 0.8 times 0.5 is 40% in, uh, in equity. Well, it's 40% in bonds because you have other equities in your small cap value. If you're 10% in small cap value, then it's 45. So kind of in that 40 to 50% range is where my recommendation puts you in terms of the amount you have in bonds. So, so tip, you are a little more aggressive in terms of how much in fixed income than Vanguard is. And by the way, Vanguard is one of the most conservative. Right. And and I think part of that has to do with how they view the, the average client they have yes. as being more uh, more conservative. Even in that conversation I had with John Bogle, the, the focus was on the people who are getting to retirement with enough. It was not ever about more than enough, but enough. And it's people who don't want to spend any time learning about personal finance or doing a lot to develop or modify their personal finance and investing behavior. I have absolutely nothing against a 100% lifetime target date fund allocation for somebody who fits that description. I think I, I think it's a very prudent way to save for a lifetime and likely have a, a comfortable retirement as long as you contribute to it regularly at, at some reasonable rate over your lifetime. I, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. Yeah. So is this become an easy transition then into discussing the the retiree and then well, not uh, until we get your recommendation. Oh, what my, your recommendation, oh, Paul? Well, okay. Okay. Nice I'm try, gonna man. take the <laughs> I, I guess I would take the position of wanting to be uh, just slightly more aggressive. Uh, and this might be for the person who doesn't have a target date fund as such, but is creating their own personal target date fund. I would probably lean on the four fund US or the four fund worldwide. I mean, they both have the same exposure to the the, the asset classes. So over a long period of time, the return is very similar. And, and that use that as the base rather than the S&P 500, rather uh, than the, inter, uh, the international uh, developed market fund being the, the base of the equity. I'd want to be a little more aggressive because when I look at all the numbers of the past, going all the way back to 1928, I don't see that four fund strategy as being, in fact, I see it as being less risky than the S&P 500 if we're looking at a five or 10 year window uh, of time. If we looked at one day at a time or one year at a time, 
there will be some individual periods that will be more risky with four than with the one. But over a longer period of time, I don't believe it is more risky. And that's, that's what hopefully we're living. And how much and how much would you have in equity? And how much would you have in fixed income? Well, I would be probably starting uh, out uh, in in retirement now, or are we talking yeah. still in the, we're talking like about right at pre-retiree, retirement. aren't we? Yeah. Uh, see, I think, number one, if you've got enough money in pre-retirement to be retired, when I was an advisor, I would start with invest today. You have enough or in many cases, more than enough to retire. The only reason they were still working uh, was because they enjoyed what they were doing in many cases, not all. But, but the bottom line is, is that if I had to pick an average, it would be about 40% in equity and uh, uh, 60, uh, 60% uh, in, in uh, sorry, this is at 40% in bonds, 60% in equity at that at that moment in time typically if i just confused what? you i'm sorry no not what? at all no okay. I, in, in fact i was just mentally kind of running the numbers right. and thinking that the portfolios we come up with aren't that different right because, right because you've got uh if you're 60 percent in equities and you've got one fourth of that in small cap value that's you know 0.6 times 0.25 is uh 13 14 percent something like that it's between yeah. the 10 and the 20 in small cap value and then you got some more in value and some more in small and yeah. you know yeah. it's i i don't i i think it's interesting that we've all looked at this and come at it from different ways but we end up at similar places the difference is you would have somebody in seven funds because you'd have them in three bonds and uh four equity funds and you would probably have them rebalance annually, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, that it gives you more control and it gives you some other benefits. Uh, but in terms of how the portfolios would actually perform, I think if we ran the back tests, they're not that different. Yeah. Likely. And, yeah. and uh, which leads then to the last group, the retirees. And I'll start on that one. I'm happy to. And that is, I would be okay. As a matter of fact, what my wife and I have, and, and I'm 78 and she's not, but she's not that much younger than I, uh, we are 50% uh, equity, 50% fixed income, uh, comfortable with that. That's a lot more equity than we would have if we were following what Vanguard does for their clients. Um, but I'm still living with the balance of big and small and value and growth and us and international and 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 very comfortable now that's with 10 equity asset classes i think you can get the same place almost with four and uh and so i would still be with that four fund strategy although you wouldn't need to be that aggressive but and then have the right amount of fixed income to to, uh, uh, to to balance whatever risk you think the market represents. And for me, I think the market always represents a loss of half of your investment. Whether you're in the S&P 500 or the four fund strategy, you gotta be ready to lose half of that money. And if we, if we aren't ready, then we have to go back and look at history and see, oh, maybe we just feel we're gonna be lucky and the market's not gonna be bad in the future. I don't know. But and if somebody, if somebody was oversaved and they knew that some percentage of the portfolio, let's say it's 20% of the portfolio is really for the next generation, they don't need it. Would you still stick with that allocation you just had, or would you invest that 20% differently? Well, in a way, Chris, I am, because we don't, we don't need the 50% in equities to make our, uh, our, our goals financially. And so that is one of the reasons that I'm more aggressive uh, in the portfolio with equities. Uh, and I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, I feel not, that not, my... not really, because so so let me make it a bigger number. Let's say they have twice what they need. <laughs> you yeah. know, in, in other words, there's there's a big there's some amount of money that's bigger, you know, 
would would you would you put that in the forefront is that what you're saying you would you I, think I would the be forefront? I, I would be satisfied okay so that's it. a good solution for the next generation the forefront my right. yes and my problem is i have always lived with the belief there's a catastrophic event right around the corner and there always is list the, the bad news list and mm -hmm. the good news list and i, I have always focus way too much on the bad potential outcome. And so that's one reason why I could have more equity in my portfolio. I could afford that. Um, and I'm sure there are young people in our family that wish I would, but I still live with this fear of collapse. And uh, that, this is the way I deal with it. So now I, I don't get much sleep, but I don't wake up because of worry, I wake up because I'm anxious to get to work on my project here. So that's a good reason. So I feel blessed in that regard. Absolutely. And Daryl, what about you on the, uh, the retired, heavily retired person? Well, I think this, you, <clears throat> we've been talking about these, these phases as if they're kind of, kind of separate and independent, but they're really not. They're, di they're different s snapshots of how things how a person's investment allocations or, or portfolios evolve over time. Um, so, in keeping with that, I would be I'd be happy with the 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 target date fund plus a, a ten or twenty percent small cap value. If you're if you're uh, uh, looks kind of you know right in the ballpark of what you need, maybe ten percent. If you if you've oversaved and you can take more risk, maybe thirty percent. Um, depend that would allow for a a legacy giving. Um, if you if it's all in tax deferred and you wanted to change things up, you could go with the four fund portfolio. I would I would have no trouble with that either. Um, if you if you wanted to, <clears throat> I'm all over the place here. I realize, but this is not a simple decision, and it is not a one size fits all. Um, if you have certain things that you're you're trying to fund out of your, if you've oversaved a lot, you have Social Security, you have a pension, let's say, um, and you and you don't need to take much from your portfolio, uh, but the portfolio needs to be there to provide insurance, if you will, for uh, either uh, catastrophic events, long-term care, let's say, if you're self-insuring, or you have a, a legacy objective uh, that you want to meet. Um, you could take that and put it into something that's a little bit safer and you can put the rest into 100% small cap value. And it's a kind of a liability matching risk portfolio uh, uh, approach that uh, Bill Bernstein has advocated. Um, so I think it depends. And again, this is kind of like what, what happened as you came up on retirement. It depends a little bit on the size of your, your nest egg versus what you have to take out of it. Um, and if you've oversaved a lot, the less you have to take out of it, the more options you have. Um, as you as your portfolio size gets closer and closer to something that would represent a uh, a, a safe withdrawal rate on average, or or maybe a little more, um, you need to become a little more conservative, but not too conservative because that work doesn't work well either. So it's a balancing act, you know. That, the the original study that Bill Bengen did back in the early 90s and and was validated by the Trinity study in the mid to late 90s says that you know you get the best bang for the buck when you're like between 40 and 60 or 30 and 70 percent equity so if you if you have less than that your failure rate goes up if you have more than that your failure rate goes up so you still have to have that equity in there and then it's a matter of what kind of equity so, and I'm okay with putting small cap value in there, even for a retiree, so, because it, it, over the over the period of times that we're talking about, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, 30 year retirement, it doesn't, there isn't very often where it underperforms the S&P 500 over those time horizons. So, so there's one really big lesson that comes out of this for me. Uh, this discussion will air uh, after I have made a presentation on April 7th 
for the Bainbridge Community Foundation, and we've got it'll it will actually be online, and it is about the need of an advisor. Do we need an advisor? Can we make all these decisions on our own? And one of the points that I make is probably everybody should spend a little bit of time in, in this process of figuring out who they are and where they're going and the best way to get there. They should spend it with uh, an advisor that they are sure is competent and they are sure is ethical. And, and, and I will tell you, it's a game changer when, if you wanna be a do-it-yourself investor, we are here to help. But you can tell, we don't have the answers in a way that we're saying, we know the size that fits everybody. Uh, so amongst the three of us, we have different solutions. So how should we know to help you to find the perfect solution? And that is the problem with being a teacher. We are, we are educators. We are not investment advisors, understanding where are you on the outside of average, the upside or the downside of average. That makes a huge difference. And if you can't figure that out, I, I think you need to get help. And I hope you will watch that video. It's the first time I've ever done a piece on, you know, do I need an advisor? Uh, and I actually called them a financial advisor. I did that on purpose. Anybody can call themselves a financial advisor. You cannot call yourself a certified financial planner. You cannot find, call yourself a registered investment advisor unless you've passed certain levels of information and testing. But anybody, anybody can call themselves, hang their, their shingle out, I am a financial advisor. Chris is, Daryl is, I am. But none of us are in the a job of telling people exactly what to do. And that's why an advisor can be so very important. Gentlemen, uh, you had to have anything to add to this uh, discussion today before we call well, it a day? I don't think you let me answer the third uh, scenario. Oh right? my God, Chris, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's why I miss you go so first all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got, I've got two thoughts. I mean, essentially my recommendations have all been what I call the aggressive two fund for life strategy, except I've given people permission to implement it in a sloppy way. Uh, I'm okay if you don't rebalance every year during accumulation. And in retirement, I would stick with that 20% small cap value, uh, the rest in a target date fund. And, you know, I the target date fund is conservative. The small cap value is aggressive. The nudge withdrawals are going to let it grow. If you've oversaved, you could put more in the small cap value. Mm -hmm. If you've oversaved and you're skittish like Paul, you could put it into the ultimate buy and hold or a four fund. Um, the one thing I wanted, wanted to add, though, is that uh, I think retirees in particular are likely, especially if they're listening to this and have never heard about a two fund solution, are likely to have a bunch of holdings that already exist. And I would encourage everybody to think really carefully about the tax implications and the trading cost implications and the emotional implications of changes and trading before you switch just to be hygienically clean and aligned with some new strategy. Um, I think for a lot of people, uh, what you have might be fine. And so even though in a theoretical sense, we're all having fun kind of, you know, moving things around and deciding what they should look like. Uh, we started this conversation way back with the best in class ETF discussion of, by discouraging people from trading too much. I'd like to close it that way, too. Yeah. I think it's easy to hear about something new and then make a bunch of changes and then realize you owe a bunch of taxes and realize your portfolio is a lot smaller and then feel bad about the changes you made. And that's that's not a path we want anybody to go down. Good advice, Chris. You guys are great. I really appreciate it. And uh, by the way, Chris uh, has uh a new uh, when did the book come out uh <laughs> oh my uh, gosh it's been six months now yeah two funds for and life it's two funds for life it hey, is look at uh, that <laughs> daryl's got the two. reviews are so good two funds for life that's great uh and uh 
Uh, I woke up at two o'clock last night and thought of a new thing I want to put in. We're talking millions. And so in about four or five months, I'm going to add a chapter to cool. two, to, to uh, we're talking millions. And I suspect what, are you going to add a chapter eventually to your book, Chris? Oh, I don't know if you could tell, but the copy here at my desk says CP markup corrections. Yeah, I've got all <laughs> kinds of stuff I want to okay. uh, iterate That's at some great. point. But um, as you well know, getting these things out is a pile of work. So it'll yeah it's better to space it out. Yeah, that's great. Well, thanks Don't for your you help. So and and uh, what was that, Daryl? What do you say? It's like your portfolio. Don't touch it too much. <laughs> right. Once, once it's set up, don't touch it too much. <laughs> I like that. All right, guys, well, you have a, have a great week. And uh, thank you, as always, for all the work that, that you put into this. I, I think everybody knows your time is 100% volunteer with a desire to help individual investors do better uh, with their investments. And uh, I, I think the return on, on the time you've put in is infinite, unbelievable. Thank you both so much. It's Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.